So, good morning. Hope you had a nice uh, long weekend. Uh, we uh, have a busy assembly of two fun things that I think you'll enjoy. Uh, so I'm going to jump into a, a few announcements and then to the first part of the program. So the first uh, comment I wanted to make is, as you would expect, uh, schools, businesses are starting to think more and more about security uh, because of the horrible tragedy of Covenant. And we have employed an extra security uh, individual so that our security guards can be much more visible on the campus. And so you will see them a lot more around the campus. And I just thought it would be important to, to make that announcement today. Uh, we have a late start on Thursday. And it will be another carpe day. And so if you come to school uh, in, a, in the fashion that would uh, be part of the spirit of that day, uh, there will be announcements about that uh, and, and, and ways in which you can report uh, how you arrived at school. Uh, the next announcement is about uh, two things. First, uh, that our spring art show opens up today at 5 p.m. Uh, certainly you can go over earlier to the Davis Building, but it would be a great way to support your friends and the art program. It will be up for uh, a couple weeks. So, so today is the inaugural event and, and reception at 5 p.m. And then one of our seniors, Jackson Priestler, uh, was recognized earlier receiving a National Gold Award from the Scholastic Art and Writing Organization for his linoleum print. He will be receiving uh, the, the award formally this summer at a ceremony at Carnegie Hall, but we thought it would be great to recognize Jackson today. Let's give him a round of applause. Dr. Creamer wrote me this weekend and, and told me that seniors David Hahn and Isaiah Doolin have been invited to present their research at the Tennessee Junior Academy of Science. Their research on potential links between the health of Nashville citizens and the local services provided to them was conducted at Belmont uh, University last summer. Also, Yadish Jindal, who presented his Belmont research at the TJA S last year was awarded their top prize and represented Tennessee this past month at the American Junior Academy of Science. And also Junior Michael Kong was just announced as one of the two grand prize winners at the Middle Tennessee Science and Engineering Fair for research he conducted at Vanderbilt. He will represent Tennessee and MBA at the Regeneron International Science and Engineering Fair in May. Let's congratulate these students on that, those recognitions. So about 10 years ago or so, uh, we uh, started having a college essay contest. And the way the contest works is that seniors are asked if they'd like to participate. They uh, tell Ms. Maddox's office. She has her office then review the college essays and they select three recipients to read their essays this morning um, at uh, the assembly. And, and this distinguished panel in front of me, uh, we're very pleased to have uh, Dr. Doug Christiansen, who's the Vice Provost for University Enrollment Affairs and the Dean of Admissions and Financial Aid. Join me in welcoming him to MBA this morning. Ms. Maggie Raines and Dr. Ed Tarkenton will be our panel judging. Of course, Ms. Maddox is alongside, and she'll come up at the end of the assembly and announce the winner. We're going to go in alphabetical order this morning, so Chandon, uh, if you'd please come up, followed by Oliver and then Jack. When I was three, my dad played a game with me. He would read one sentence of a book, then guide me through the next. He'd read a third sentence, and I'd read a fourth. We pulled book after book from the shelf, running through novels of fantasy, mystery, and adventure. But my favorite lines to take turns with 
came from a bulky, colorful masterpiece. It was called My First Question and Answer Book. Here, we played the game a little bit differently. I'd pick a question, and then he'd read the answer. I was hooked. This book was genius. It answered all the questions I'd ever thought to ask, and it urged me further, asking questions I'd never even dreamed of. Can galaxies crash? Why do bees make honey? How many balloons would it take to lift a human? Did the Vikings really go berserk? Captivated, I asked my dad for more and more. And most of the time, he earnestly agreed. But inevitably, as we stretched into the dark of night, I would ask a question, and he would pause, glance at his watch, and say, no more for tonight, Den. The stickler for the rules, I always complied. If he wouldn't read the answer, I could do nothing but wait until the next night. My curiosity was shackled, but it champed at the bit to run free. Nothing stimulated my curiosity quite like that book did until I found policy debate. More specifically, the research that competitive policy debate requires. Of course, the structure of this game is nothing like the one I played with my dad, and yet, it drives me in the same way that question and answer book did. Asking questions and leaving me hungry for answers. Can carbon sequestration solve climate change? Why did Russia invade Ukraine? Was Freud right about psychoanalysis? Will artificial intelligence conquer the world? Is American democracy doomed? Unfortunately, an all-knowing book can't answer these questions. No single book ever will. But I find myself asking them anyway, scouring digital libraries and digging into deep corners of the internet, eager to find the answers. Now, this task is nothing, if not Sisyphean. Climate change, Russia, Freud, AI, and democracy seem to operate on totally different planes of reality. How could I possibly expect to find the answers to 10 questions in one field, let alone the answers to virtually every question in every field. Maybe I should hunker down and focus my attention on something easier to solve instead. Now, that's, that's not my style. And regardless, tunnel vision is the enemy of curiosity. My dad's question and answer book worked because it allowed me to explore the world non-linearly. I could jump from history to geography to science without batting an eye. And in the process, I discovered connections I would never have seen otherwise. In the same way, in my research, I uncover answers to questions in places I would never have expected. Putin has often stated that he intends to take advantage of global warming. Perhaps we can identify areas where he'll try to use his influence next. Artificial intelligence might not take over the world, but it could be the answer to better predicting and mitigating climate change. A fuller understanding of human psychology could help us create a more vibrant democracy. Or maybe not. Maybe my research will finally reveal that these problems really are too big for me, that they're insoluble. But even if that's the case, I'll have found something else instead. A love for the chase, for the journey for the thrill of the hunt. In a way, I'm still playing that game my dad created, asking questions and seeking answers. But instead of stopping at bedtime, I'm just getting started. As I've grown older, I've realized that the most valuable skill I've gained in school is the ability to put my life in perspective, to zoom out and see where I stand in the context of history and the global community. Sometimes I think of my life as a puzzle piece and the world as a puzzle with billions of pieces. Alone, I do not amount to much, 
but if I can connect with others, I can achieve a more holistic view of my own life. I live more gratefully and as a better person to those around me when I internalize what a small mark my life is making and a comprehensive view of the world. In June of 2022, I traveled with a group of classmates to London, Normandy, and Paris to visit sites from the Second World War. This trip has always been a dream of mine because of my interest in history and the amount of time I have spent studying World War II in various history classes. With seven other students and two teachers, I was able to visit the Churchill War Rooms, the Imperial War Museum, and Omaha Beach, among other incredible sites and museums. The most impactful memory that I took home with me was not necessarily the specific battle tactics or the unbelievable logistical efforts of the war, even though those were captivating. What struck me the most were the individual stories of the soldiers. Going into the Normandy Museum and seeing personal items that Allied soldiers carried with them through Europe, like wristwatches, pocketbooks, and small photos of loved ones, made these stories come to life for me. As I stood on Omaha Beach with the same stand, sand beneath me as the American soldiers on D-Day, I felt something my textbook could never convey, humility. I felt great sadness and tremendous gratitude for what happened on June 6, 1944, but those emotions had previously been communicated to me, although to a lesser extent through casualty statistics. Humility superseded the sadness and gratitude, maybe because it was unexpected, but probably because my worldview had been expanded. I saw my life snap into the context of the world story, and I felt the smallest I ever have when I was standing on that tranquil beach. The horizon was no longer painted black by ships, and the sand was no longer stained red, but the emotions extracted from the scene were unalterable. I found on the beach that day something to take home with me that I sincerely believed in, the power of humility. Compared to the history of, of the world, our lives might seem inconsequential, but that does not mean we should give everything a passive effort. I believe in making an active effort to practice humility in my own life by putting others before myself. I try to take time every day to recognize the people around me who make my life and my experiences possible. The women at the front desk, the grounds crew, the security guards, my teammates, and my teachers. I enjoy spending time talking to all of them because I know that our community would not be possible without all of us working for each other. By embracing one another, rather than being only acquaintances, we make the connections in our puzzle stronger and begin to find purpose and meaning together. Remembering that I am just one piece of that puzzle allows me to join together with the people around me and give my life consequence. My identity has evolved in my six years at MBA. From the outset, I wanted to play basketball and baseball, as I had in middle school. In my first seventh grade basketball tryouts, I was assigned to guard now four-star Texas A&M commit Marcel Reed. He destroyed me. The outcome of these tryouts was obvious, but my next steps weren't. I had already had one quarter of debate under my belt. What I thought was as a gap sport to fulfill the sport, the sport requirement suddenly became a new obsession. In sports, I excelled on the tactical end. I loved analyzing formations, plays, and rosters. Debate, as I learned, was just as tactical and strategic. Sometimes, instead of taking notes in class, I would draw argument maps, as I called them, a visual diagram of an answer to an answer to an answer. Every argument would be answered offensively or defensively. Debaters, too, tended to be offensive or defensive with their own style of debate and argumentation. The problem was, was that I was objectively bad at debate. I tend to understand the tactics and strategies at play, but failed in execution. It was truly disheartening. My improvement came along with my second discovery, philosophy. The debate community has an interesting divide between the policy community and the critique community. 
the policy crowd tends to argue in terms of object objective hypothetical standards. The critique community argues with a philosophical brush, using examples and often obtuse theories to prove an argument. The two communities often characterize each other, each, each other in broad strokes. The policy debaters call the critical ones intentionally obtuse and insulting to the game, whereas the critique debaters call the policy debaters stuck up and intentionally ignorant. Despite my policy upbringing, because of my natural love debate, I delved into the critique community. In my search for understanding, I grabbed a copy of Being in Time. I read the first few pages and my, my head felt fuzzy. Immediately, I was hit with terms like diocin and unterschutzen. Did they even try translating this book into digestible argumentation? However, I kept pursuing philosophical knowledge. No matter the gaps in my understanding in reading Locke to Foucault, I pursued vigilantly. Looking back, I understand it was probably futile as me as a 14-year-old student to understand some of these massively heady concepts. However, I don't regret it whatsoever. My newfound passion of philosophy did indeed help me in debate. I became MBA debate's switch hitter and eventually captain of critical research. But now, the beautiful world of philosophy is somewhat severed its exclusive tie to debate. They exist on parallel tracks. Sometimes I read an interesting philosophical argument and apply it to debate, or vice versa. Regardless of my high school debate success, the study of philosophy will stay with me forever. It educates me in every area of my life, from better understanding and loving of my friends, or understanding the ethics of eating Popeyes, or using psychoanalytic critique to watch the boys. Whatever it may be, philosophy is my principal tutor in my quest to become a more complete self. And I hope to pursue the field as I transition into college. Thank you, uh, Chandon and Oliver and Jack. Uh, this contest uh, was conceived with the hope that it'd be a, a great way to express uh, the variety of ways in which you can write a, a college essay and, and be successful. And so I thank Stephen Bess in particular, I think is watching. Stephen is a 2000, I'm sorry, 1995 graduate of MBA. Uh, he is currently living in Salt Lake City, went on to a to play baseball from here and, and did a great job academically and personally at Rice University and has worked in California and now Salt Lake and he helped uh, come up with this idea, fund the prizes and we're grateful for that. All right, we're gonna have a bit of a transition now and uh, Ms. Dr. Faru Aman, will you please come up? Uh, just a few quick announcements before we start this uh, integral B in math. Uh, first, I wanted to mention that uh, Ethan Durham uh, talked with me last week, two weeks ago, about uh, his concerns about uh, the uh, events of Covenant, and he wants to stage a peaceful demonstration downtown this Saturday. Uh, wants people to wear red and black in, in honor uh, of uh, Covenant, uh, and to protest the legality of assault weapons in Tennessee and the non-existence of any background checks for buying weapons. He was going to make this announcement himself this morning, but he went home not feeling well. There will be further announcements uh, this week uh, about that event. Uh, and if we could please put the slide up about the film. Uh, there it is. Thank you. All right, boys. Uh, this Sunday, the NBA Classic Cinema Series will be continuing with a screening of The Wild One, 1953. Uh, it's a landmark movie. It was banned in a lot of states when it came out. In fact, it was banned in England for 14 consecutive years because it was uh, seen to promote lawlessness and anarchy on the streets. It's a fascinating film. Uh, it's about um, two rival uh, motorcycle gangs descend on a sleepy American village one day and the local law enforcement don't know how to handle them. And it just critiques the chaos and the sort of customs of a uh, of the times. Um, if you would like to come, it's, it's free admission, and as it's a Sunday, you can bring anyone you like, um, parents, friends, brothers, sisters, uh, all welcome. Dead Poets, this Sunday, 3 p.m. Thank you. And Aziz 
And uh, if you're, you would come up now with uh, your friends to make the announcement. There you are. Hi, I'm Hami Asin, and I'm with the Islamic Studies Club. Uh, Ramadan is the ninth month of the Islamic calendar, and during it, Muslims are meant to fast every day from sunrise to sunset. And it's meant to be a period of spiritual reflection and just a general time of prayer. Um, the fast is broken every evening with a meal called iftar, uh, which is normally spent with families and friends. And the point of Ramadan is to gain a better empathy for the poor and the less fortunate who often can't have a meal every night. And at the end of the month, there's a holiday called Eid al-Fatr, which is, marks the end of Ramadan. So uh, this Saturday, um, April 16th, the Islamic Studies Club will have a annual iftar meal uh, for anyone who wants to come, if you're, in, uh, if you're interested. Um, it's gonna be basically, a, uh, there's gonna be a speaker and uh, there'll be food and um, bring some friends and family. If you want to try fasting a day, go ahead. Um, hope to see you there. Yes, this Sunday, April 16th. Um, yeah, on another note, Ramadan is also a time for increased charitable giving and community service. I'm sure many of you have heard about the devastating earthquake that impacted Syria and Turkey a couple of months ago. Uh, sadly, countless lives were destroyed, uh, displacing thousands from their homes and leaving them helpless and grieving. Although there has been efforts for relief, many of these families still need help, which is why the Islamic Studies Club, along with the Service Club, uh, is making a fundraiser to help these communities to support those in need. Even a small contribution can make the difference between the necessary critical resources. Um, so yeah, we plan to send out an email soon, so please look out for that. Um, also, starting tomorrow during lunch blocks, we'll have donation bins where you can drop off some money and um, after, during lunch throughout the week. And also we will have a Venmo code so you could donate online. Um, please donate, every donation helps significantly. Uh, thank you. Thank you guys for that interest and those announcements. This Sunday, uh, they'll put some more announcements so you'll have that, those times at 6.30. Uh, so, uh, Mr. Davidson's gonna come up now and present another very uh, great event. All right, I'll welcome down the judges, uh, our five esteemed judges, if you'd come to the judges table up front, and then our finalists, Reed Grooms and Darwin Deng, if you'd come to the front. make a couple summary announcements about the math season which just uh, wrapped up on the whole except for math counts nationals with the state math contest if the uh, competitors want to test out their markers and erasers make sure the buzzers are working okay feel free All right, guys, I know we're doing a lot during assembly today. This should be a very fun competition, but I want to give a quick summary. We've had a great math season. I want to summarize a few results, and then we'll do our championship round. Uh, also, thank you to uh, Mrs. Maggie Chen, who stopped by to root on her two former math students today. So thanks for Maggie for coming. Um, a lot of these have been announced previously unofficially. We now have official results for a lot of, uh, a lot of, these, a lot of these math competitions. Uh, I think you've heard that we had the, uh, again, repeated as Math Count State Champions, which is great. Uh, today we also got all the individual data for the contest. For those of you not familiar with Math Counts, a perfect individual score is a 46. 
There are 30 questions worth one point and eight questions worth two points, so a perfect score is 46. Uh, our team qualified for the state competition. The state competition, almost no one nationally gets a perfect score. They're trying to differentiate the top students in the country. Uh, so just for reference, I think you've heard that Justin Guo won the individual state championship. The second place score in Tennessee of all the middle school math students in the state was a 29 out of 46. That was second place. Justin got 39 out of 46. So 10 points higher than second place. Um, we also wrapped up our uh, city math contest competitions are, these are the official results now that all the schools have reported. MBA finished first in Algebra 1, third in Geometry, first in Algebra 2, first in Precalculus, first in Calculus, third in Statistics. Uh, at the state competition, I want to go through our, all the top 10 finishers. It'll take a few months to compile results from the full state. This is just within the greater Nashville area. In Algebra 1, we, uh, MBA tied for first place. Briley Beck and William Guo got first place. Hunter Saba, third place. Gar Sahu, fourth place. In Geometry, we have the top two finishers in the Nashville region. Number one, Kevin Lee. Number two, Brody Willis. In Algebra 2, first place, Justin Guo. Fifth place, Jake Dorfman. In Statistics, we had six students enter. All, stick, all six finished in the top 10, including three students who got perfect scores to finish first in the state and or first in Nashville, which should also be first in the state. Number one finishers were Michael Kong, Jackson Leffler, and Arish Singvi. Sixth place, Chandon Klimico. Eighth place, George Ma. Tenth place, Eli Stark. In pre-calculus, we had the third place finisher, William Pang. Fifth, David Nee. Eighth, Eric Chen. And in calculus, uh, both of these uh, students finished in the top 10. In fact, first was Darwin Dang. Second, Henry Pitt. Fifth, Reed Grooms. Seventh, Mac Russ. And eighth, Whit Uden. Um, so a round of applause for all the mathletes this season. Um, I want to take the chance, because I probably won't get another two. Typically, I think every math class has about one or two exceptional math students. This senior class is a very special class. We will miss them greatly. We have really, I'd say, at least four or five truly exceptional math students. However, I'm also hopeful the future is very bright with, as you saw, the rest of the competitors at those competitions. Uh, because it's very tough, I think those of you who remember last year's competition, the first integral was a doozy. I knew we had two returning competitors who are very, very sharp. There are a handful of pretty tough integrals in here, so please be quiet during the competition, uh, but if they get it right, please don't be quiet and support your, your, your classmates, because these are some very tough integrals to start. Uh, quick reminders, do not forget plus C on the indefinite integrals. Uh, if something, is, if you can calculate sine, cosine, tangent, or arc sine, arc cosine, arc tangent, because it's a special triangle, please do so. Uh, when you buzz in, if you get it wrong, the person has the remainder of the four minutes to answer. Are there any questions? All right. In that case, with no further ado, when the first integral is on the board, I'll hit the start button. Good luck. Quiet, please.
has y, root x plus two squared plus one minus six times the arc tangent of what's that plus one over there? Root x plus three plus two. Judges? That is correct. <laughs> That's very impressive. Um, let's reset. All right, when inter integral two appears, I will start the clock. Pi over three plus two root three is correct. <laughs> All right, I think, I think everyone understands, but it's first to two, the score is one to one. The next correct integral will be our integral B champion.
Ahmad has attended the tree now. Can we confer with the leaders? Ninety seconds. All right, yeah. Darwin's right, he just forgot the absolute value. It was natural log of nine when simplified. All right, that means it's still one to one. All right, still one to one. When the fourth integral's up, I'll hit the start button. Integral from 1867 to 2023 of x squared minus floor x ceiling x dx. You have three minutes and 21 seconds.
60 seconds, quiet please. That's incorrect. All right, guys, a couple notes. The correct answer was 156 divided by three, which equals 52. All right. They are going to start getting easier, which means it may be a bit of a more mad dash to the table. So let's be quiet, give the guys a second to focus. Remember, it must be on the board if it's going to count. You can't just run to the board, it has to be written down if you're going to have it be your answer. They're going to start getting easier now. Let me get by the timer. And still champion, Darwin Dang. All right, let's have a round of applause for both competitors. All right. Just uh, please uh, just give me a couple minutes here to finish up. And first, thanks for your patience uh, during the longer assembly. I wanted to remind you that uh, the mother-son uh, dinner is Wednesday night. We have an exceptional program. A woman named Allison Crowther is going to be here. She has made a mission of her life to remember her son, Wells, who was in the finance world in New York and also a volunteer fireman. When 9-11 happened, he went down to the World Trade Center because he felt it was his duty to help and to save people. He wound up saving 75 people. He wore a red bandana because of the uh, amount of dust uh, at the World Trade Center and sadly he lost his life when the building collapsed. Thus she has made her life's mission to remember him and we will do the same on Wednesday evening. So it should be a fabulous program. Uh, I wanted to congratulate uh, Mr. Killian for being the Middle Tennessee Coach of the Year in Swimming. Let's give him a round of applause. We had a, a great week of sports last week. I won't go over it all because of time, but I did want to highlight how well the crew team did up in Ohio. They just uh, won the, the, the trophy for the day. And then finally, Ms. Maddox will come up and report the winner of the college essay contest. We will be quick in the, in the, uh, to make certain that we can get going. I wanted to start by thanking um, Chandon, Oliver, and Jack for reading their stories. Guys, it's hard to get up here and, and share your story with other people, but I hope what you saw from their essays is that it's not what they've done, but it's what they've learned from what they do. You all have amazing experiences every day. Continue to do that and make certain that you process that and you think of what you're taking away from those experiences. It was a hard choice, but Chandon, congratulations. You are the winner this year. Congratulations, thanks for your patience. Have a good week.